Hello everyone! Once again we meet here in our show Connected. I'm glad you had the time to spend these 30 minutes with me. I want to remind you that I am here in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, South America. I want to uh, greet you and I want to let you know that we are going to connect today with a friend that it lives in Chicago, USA. Also, I want to remind you that you don't only see us through our Abia Yellow channel, but you can also check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. is going to kind of inspire us to go back in time because uh, what's the best uh, way to hear a story right like let's say something happened in your day and you want to tell your friend or you want to tell your family the best way to do it is actually when we gather together and we are able to do the the communication face to face right um, nowadays we have a lot of uh, communication going through technology but I want to rescue this beautiful activity called storytelling there are people out there that uh, they dedicate their lives to go to places let's say to schools to libraries and what they do is they gather people and they tell stories and they use the story as a tool in order to send messages send messages about self-esteem, send messages about how to care about your environment, how to be a better person. Today I am very, um, I'm very grateful to have the guest that we have today. We are lucky to meet her. Her name is um, Mama Edie. She lives in Chicago, USA, as I said before, and she has uh, dedicated her whole life to do exactly this to go to different places to talk to different audiences and to tell stories and through her stories she is able to help people uh, get better and to improve their own lives so stick around don't go anywhere we will be back and we're going to meet Mama Edie all the way from uh, Chicago USA stay tuned we'll be right back Welcome back everyone and as promised I am already connected with my special guest Mama Eddie. She's talking to us from Chicago, USA. Mama Eddie, welcome to the show. Let's go ahead with the first question. I really want you to explain to us or tell us what was your first um, your first experience with storytelling? How did you get to love storytelling so much? Well, storytelling has always been a part of my life ever since I can remember. My family has been among some of the best storytellers that I've ever known. And my father and my uncles, when we would come together and have our family reunions, they would tell us so many stories and sometimes we couldn't tell which ones were true and <laughs> which ones were just made up tales. And, some of them would be so fantastic and especially my uncle Earl and he'd be so expressive and so much into it and we'd be looking at him and then finally we'd say uncle Earl did that really happen that didn't really happen did he? he'd say sure sure it did <laughs> so I think um, <laughs> the way they could make very simple things come to life was very inspiring for me and I think I was hooked on stories ever since I see. And when you do your presentations, when you go to places with your stories, which are the elements that you use in order to make all the magic happen? Use of voice um, with the highs and the lows and, and uh, sometimes even a whisper. Uh, sometimes slowing it down if there's something mysterious going on, you know, or oh my goodness, you know, so the element of facial expressions and your eyes popping <laughs> and, and even right. hands, I talk to hands, you know, and because um, I also know sign language as a speech and language pathologist, I used to teach deaf people how to talk. 
And so I did learn sign language and would use the sign language also with some of my children with special needs who could not communicate so that they would at least have a way wow. to communicate. And um, so, yeah, so sometimes I sign within the story, sometimes intentionally, but a lot of times not. I just talk with my hands, so yeah. And also musical instruments. I don't use a lot for interactive components uh, of a performance. I may use maracas or shekeres, the West African beaded gourd that has the shells uh, around it. Right. And, um, uh, but in terms of instrumentation, typically I will play the shekere in a song. And uh, one of the things that connects uh, stories within the African and African American tradition is often the use of incorporated music. Not always, but often many storytellers who use this particular medium do incorporate either song or chants and definitely African call and response to get everybody involved. And, and also sometimes I will have uh, participants to come into the presentation space with me. Uh, like I did earlier right. today, and actually participate and play the maracas and sing the songs and, and do different <laughs> things. So it's very active, very active, and we all come alive. Correct. And tell us a little bit about what are the messages or the topics that you generally use on your storytelling? What is the message that Mama Eddie wants to send to humanity? Well, as Mama Edie the storyteller, and in fact, as Mama Edie, the speech and language pathologist, the, the use of storytelling uh, in public. Well, I did, I did prose and poetry in intercollegiate competition uh, when I was at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois. And um, I did well in both events. Uh, but when I became a speech and language pathologist, I found that many of my children didn't know much about themselves uh, as members of their own culture. Um, right. Most of the children I've worked with were either African American or Latino. Um, I've worked with children of other cultures as well, but the majority of them over the past so many years have either been uh, African American and or Latino. And many of them, especially among the African Americans, didn't really know that much about themselves and they didn't feel good about themselves. And then we had issues like uh, skin color. And um, it's, it's really sad, but in the 2000s and in, in 1900s, uh, 1990s, and, and even now, people still sometimes criticize each other about being too dark or being too light or being too this or being too that. And so I use stories that help people to see the beauty in them that I see. And I want them to see it for themselves because it can have an impact on their overall personal growth and development. It can have an impact right. on how they're able to focus and attend in school. And it can have an impact on their relationships um, on into the future. And so there are also topics relative to social justice and uh, cultural awareness and cultural sensitivity. So those are basically the, the majority of the areas of focus. The, my bottom line is that I want people to see them, the beauty that they have. I want them to see the gift that they are to the world. I want them to feel empowered to do what it is to use their lives to make a difference, to rise up, to help other people to rise up. And... Um, okay. To, to just appreciate all the beauty of the world and to help protect that and continue to propagate it forward. That is such a beautiful work that you do because with our well, modernity and all these new times, it's we see less and less this, this kind of work, less and less out there. How many times did you perform so far? <laughs> well, <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. I probably, you don't even have a number anymore for it. I don't have any idea. My very first professional performance was okay. in, in February of 1989. And okay. that one performance, and it came to me, I was resigning from uh, the, the work that I did doing speech therapy. 
with uh, the Chicago Public Schools. I was a speech therapist assistant at that time. We were a pilot program for the country. And, um, but I was working towards my master's degree. So they didn't allow us, uh, because of the category of employee that we were, they didn't allow us to simply take a leave of absence. So I had to resign. And, uh, and wow. of course, the, um, the practicum experiences were non-paid experiences. So that was gonna be kind of tricky. <laughs> Continuing to support my daughter, my brother had gotten sick, was moving in with me from California. People were saying, how are you gonna survive? And I said, I haven't right. the faintest idea, but something's going to work. And as I was on my way out the door, a woman, I need to mention her by name, Dr. Deirdre Roberson, was a psychologist with the Chicago Public Schools. And uh, she approached me and she said, you know, I'm so glad I bumped into you because my children belong to Jack and Jill and we're having a cultural celebration next month in February and we want somebody to come in and do this and do that. And I'm like, why is this lady telling me all this stuff? And she said, well, that's what you do. What's your fee? And I had only been doing things in my classrooms with my kids. I was doing, uh, in like 1978, 79, I started doing something called classroom language stimulation sessions. That's what I called them. Now a lot of people are doing things in the class. Um, but um, but we, I brought language, the, the learning of language to life through story and through music. And then I started, once I saw the issues that my children had with identity, I started writing poetry and plays and songs and I would teach them to them and they would help me to write them because I wanted them to see themselves reflected in the end product. And we would do performances on the stage. I'd have my babies do performances on stage and somebody's on <laughs> TV. It's like the family business we could say, huh? <laughs> yeah. It was very wonderful, it was very wonderful, but I, I was an itinerant speech uh, therapy assistant. So over the 11 years that I was with Chicago Public Schools, I had serviced about 14 different schools. And in each one, wow. I established the celebration of Kwanzaa, uh, the African-American holiday celebration, the cultural celebration. And, um, and we did all kinds of plays. So that's how Dr. Roberson knew about what I was doing. I, you know, you, you never know, you don't think anybody's thinking about you. You just do what you do, because that's what you do. And um, so I did do her event for the Jack and Jill organization. And there were two teachers in that group. They invited me to their schools and the word continued to spread by word of mouth. And that's the way it evolved. And um, one of the most significant situations was when I found myself in uh, a preschool setting and uh, I was on the northwest side of Chicago or maybe in Humboldt Park and and I'm but there were a lot of African-American children there several Euro-American children and but a lot right. of Latinos and so I'm telling these stories and I'm I guess I was telling the story about why dogs chase cats and I knew that was a funny story and uh, because people always <laughs> enjoy that story and I'm just telling my story and going and got the dog chasing the cat and doing all kinds of things. And, and some of the kids were laughing and some of the kids were looking at me like, I said, what is wrong with these kids? <laughs> this is a funny story. Why aren't they laughing at my story? <laughs> and then it hit me. I looked at them. I hadn't, and this, I guess in a way, this is kind of a good thing. I just saw them as a classroom full of children. I hadn't gone in and said, okay, here's so many African-American children, here's so many white children, here's so many Latinos. It was just a classroom full. They were just my, all my babies at the time. And it did hit me until later, oh my God, some of the kids are not understanding me because they don't speak English. Right. Exactly. So, so that is when you became bilingual. I switched, <laughs> I switched right then, right within the story. I switched and I started talking about El Perro you know, and El Gato, Senor Gato, and, and you know, and I'd go back and forth between English and Spanish, so great. and then the children who were sitting there looking like this went into looking like this, and they started laughing and clapping, and I knew, I knew then that that was what I needed to do, that I needed to, I needed to strengthen my own Spanish. 
so that I could help them to feel more visible, more present, right. more included. And so they, they could also benefit from the experience. So that was definitely one of the most um, one of the most significant experiences, and uh, and I suppose the one of the others. There've been so many, but one other is where I had gone in to do one of my classroom language simulation sessions, and the classroom teacher was trying to teach these children with learning disabilities. Uh, her name was Mrs. Christian, and she would not mind me mentioning her name. I've already asked her, and. Um, she was trying to teach them what they needed to know in order to pass the test uh, to graduate. And they needed to know about the Constitution and the Revolutionary War and all those kinds of things. And she was so frustrated when I got there. She said, I said, are you ready for your session? She said, come on in here. I'm just sick of them because they can't seem to pass this test. And yada, yada, yada. <laughs> Go sit down somewhere. So <laughs> she went and sat down and I saw how little they really understood. And so I began with George III. I became George III. And I explained that he's called George III because his daddy's name was George. He was George II. And his daddy before him, he was George I. And that's how this guy got to be George III. So within the story, <laughs> I see in my teaching the um, civics aspect, but I'm also teaching that system of, uh, of, of naming, you know, that somebody is the third and the fourth and that kind of thing. So I became George okay. III, sent his red coats over. I became the red coats. <laughs> I, right. I became the, the uh, Paul Revere and his horse. I was galloping across the classroom. <laughs> the classroom teacher was falling out laughing. I was the Native Americans with their bows and arrows. I was the new Americans up in the trees. I was everybody all by myself. Aww. Everybody fell out laughing. But the key is that after I was done, the children had learned all the concepts they needed to understand. And they all, every last one of them passed that test. And I said, I've got exactly. something. Exactly. That part of your work is such a beautiful, um, is such a beautiful way to connect with people, right? Because you are right there, face to face, and you have the um, the ability to figure it out or to sense if they are understanding or not. And just you, with your knowledge and your power and your magic, you just turn yourself into whatever it takes in order to make it to make them understand you what would you say is the future this of a storytelling what what would you think or what would you advise what what how do you feel like the future is coming for this beautiful uh, activity which is storytelling it's a wonderful question and thank you for asking it um i feel optimistic about the future of storytelling despite the technology and one of the reasons is because yes there was definitely there were definitely years during which storytelling uh, to a large extent for many people seemed to be dormant it was just a sleeping part of our past but there have always been pockets of people who kept stories alive some of these pockets of people have come together to form organizations that have become national organizations and international organizations. For example, there's an organization that I belong to that's called the National Storytelling Network. And uh, it's mm -hmm. based, it was based in Jonesboro, Tennessee, in one of our southern states, but now it's moved to another state, the state of Missouri in Kansas. And um, it started out being a national, well, probably local, and then it spread out across the country. And um, but now there are people in other countries that are also part of the national so uh, the national storytelling network. They simply haven't changed the name to reflect the international appeal or or expansion that it has appreciated. Uh, so that's a wonderful thing and they have a festival every year and this is an organization that has got to be um, close to 40 years old if, if, 
<clears throat> just a, around 40 years old would be my best guess. And um, from that, there were two women, um, Mother Mary Carter Smith, uh, peace be upon her, she's now among the ancestors, and Mama Linda Goss. And they had attended, now these are two African American women who had okay. attended the National Storytelling Network's festival. But the majority of the people there, like 98% of the people there were Euro Americans, they were white. And so they looked around and they saw how wonderful it was, this sense of connection and this sense of community and this sense of uh, the importance of carrying forth our stories, not just the folk tales, but the real stories, the stuff that really happened, the kinds of stories that, that help us to see the kind of difficulty people have had and what they've been able to rise up from to give us the kind of hope to know that well, whatever our circumstances are, we too can rise up from our circumstances. If they could do it, I can do it. You know, I, uh, for example, right. when I think about the circumstances that my African and Native American ancestors went through, and yet they survived, that we can say that despite all of that, despite land being taken and lives being taken and, and so many atrocities and so many trails of tears, despite all of those things, we're still here. Yeah. We are a strong people. We are a strong people, but we gotta believe that in order for us to manifest the kinds of, of um, and forward movement required in order for us to to be as successful, however we choose to define it, as we can possibly be, to be as healthy and as whole and connected and joyful and at peace right. as we can be. So there are many stories, many different kinds of stories that need to be told. But these two women, Mother Mary Carter Smith and Mom Melinda Goss, um, they said, we need this among black folk. And so they started very small, they started an organization that has grown to become the National Association of Black Storytellers. And it is that based is great. in Yeah, it's based in Baltimore, Maryland. And in fact I served as the national chair of the membership committee of that organization for nine years as of last January. And uh, we were able to establish some some wonderful extensions from it. So and we have local organizations. Um, I was the founding co-chair of ASHE, the Chicago Association of Black Storytellers. We act as an affiliate right. of national organization. So it's grown in terms of organizational expansiveness and, um, and even people in the television industry. You hear more often people talking about storytelling now rather than movies. They're using the word storytelling. Right. Mama Eddie, I want to tell you, well, I want to tell everybody that we're going to go to a cut now and when we come back, we're going to have Mama Eddie telling us a short story so we can kind of like uh, experience a little bit of her magic. Um, don't go anywhere. We will, we'll be right back with more Mama Eddie. We'll be right back. Stay connected. Welcome back to Connected and we are still with my special guest, Mama Edie. We're gonna go ahead, Mama Edie, with the last question. And I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you, what is the feedback every time you finish one of your events? And I'm sure you have different type of audiences, but just as like a general, um, just as, as a general answer, what's the feedback after the presentations of Mama Edie? They've been phenomenal. Uh, generally, they've been very, very wonderful. Um, one especially that I'm thinking of that I did just a couple of days ago, there were roughly about 500 children or so uh, in a school assembly. And- um, 500, they, you said? Yes, well, I, I've done oh, as wow. few as five, and as many as 500. <laughs> of course- <laughs> Wow, course, that's a big crowd. Yes, when I performed in India, there were like millions, you know, but I wasn't there alone. There were other people also there. But um, at this particular event, 
the the children were and this was middle school children like uh, roughly between 11 and say 13 years old and they can be a very tough audience but these children they, sure. were, they were right there and what happened was that they were so quiet 500 kids you could barely hear a pin drop they were right there and then when it was done all the kids who wanted to come up to get hugs and to take pictures and it was absolutely <laughs> wonderful i got home they were writing me letters on email this is what i thought of the program and i really like this and i learned this and one little boy told me i really oh, thought that it was is so great to take care of each other and to be kind to each other and watch the power of our words and when i grow up this is what I'm going to do, you know. So it was, it was really wonderful. So, and then when I work with adults, and I do work with uh, conflict resolution uh, across cultures, for them to get to the point where they feel safe enough to cry with each other and to admit that maybe they were small-minded about the way they saw something, and to apologize to each other, and to embrace oh, and hug wow. and start again. That's what it's that all about. That is such a beautiful. It's so I I believe how can you I can only imagine how do you feel after you finish and they come and tell you all of these beautiful things. It's just so wonderful to hear. So Mama Edie, let's do this. Say hi. I'm going to leave a space for you to say hi to Bolivia and to all the people that are listening to you and then later after that you can go ahead and start uh, with a, a little short story that you're gonna give it to us. Is that okay? Okay, so should I say hi now? Yes, go ahead. Hola. <laughs> Como están ustedes? <laughs> Muy bien. <laughs> Very happy to be here. I see. <laughs> And that was all for today. I will see you again in seven days. And I want to remind you, if you know anybody that is making a difference, that is starting a new trend, or that is just doing something great for him or herself or for their community, don't hesitate and contact me. Also, if you are the person that should is doing some work that should be known uh, by the world, so hit me up. My email address is conectadosbolivia24 at gmail.com. We are going to have it write it down here and just send me an email and I will be happy to connect with you. I will see you in seven days and now I'll leave you with a short story by Mama Edie. Until next time, goodbye. My story goes like this. Había una vez una familia de ratoncitas. Once upon a time, there was a family of little mice. There was Mama Raton, Papa Raton, Hermana y Hermano. And one day, Mama looked up at the sky. She said, Ah, familia mía, mi familia, mira el cielo hermoso. Look at that beautiful sky. She said, Yo tengo una buena idea. I have a good idea. Vamos a comer en el parque. We're going to eat in the park. And so the children said, hooray, they were so happy. And so she made some pollo frito. Oh, you know that fried chicken. She made some platano, some wonderful bananas. She made some papas or fries. She had frutas, all kinds of wonderful fruits. And she put them all into the big canasta, into the big basket. Papi came along and he said, ah, that's going to be heavy, pero no te preocupes, porque mira mis músculos grandes. Look at my great big muscles. And mommy said, oh, Papi, go on. <laughs> so they picked up the basket and off the family went to the park. It was a beautiful day. The sky was blue and birds were flying everywhere. And they set up everything and mommy said, Nino, she said, ayúdame, help me, help me get everything set up. They said, ah, oh, mommy, we don't want to help. Vamos a jugar, we're going to go and play. And so she said, hmm, es una buena idea, porque papi and I, we're going to sit here and smooch. They said, ew, mommy, papi, we're out of here. <laughs> and so they ran off to play. They played soccer, they played spin around, but then, as they were playing, they were by a huge fence. And hermana said to hermano, she said, hermano, he says, si. Sí. She said, yo creo que el señor gato vive aquí. I think that Mr. Cat lives there. He said, ah, 
No te preocupes, don't worry about it. Yo no tengo miedo del gato, I ain't scared of no cat. <laughs> and so she said, well, me neither. So they played and played, played, played and played. They played and played, played, played and played. But then guess <laughs> came along. Señor Gato. Badu, 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 badu. Oh my goodness. There he was with those great big ojos verdes, those great big green eyes, those dientes grandes, those big teeth. They said, hola gato. But he looked at them and licked his lips. And then he jumped down off the fence. He went running after them, corriendo, corriendo, corriendo. And they were screaming, ah, mami, papi, ayúdanos, ayúdanos, help us, help us, help us. Running, 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 running. And so when they got back to mommy, where mommy and papi were, guess what they were doing? Still besando. They said, ay, mommy, papi, mira, el gato está aquí. Mommy said, ay, papi, what are we going to do? He said, ah, no te preocupes, don't worry about it. Yo no tengo miedo del gato. She said, okay, well, then do something. And he did. Do you know what papi did? He ran and hid behind his wife, detrás de su esposa. She said, papi, what are you doing back there? <laughs> he said, well, I don't know what to do. Hermana ran back there, y hermano ran back there. And there was mommy. Cara, cara, face to face with Señor Gato. He got right up close to her. And she was saying, ay, Dios mío, what am I going to do? And all of a sudden, she had an idea. And with everything inside of her, she went deep down inside and she said, Woof! That cat looked at her. She said, I think it's working. So she barked again. Woof! And he jumped back. She said, come on, you guys, it's working, bark with me. So the whole family of mice began barking at the cat. And so they barked and they barked, bark, 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 and that cat took off running. Boogity, 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 corriendo, corriendo. He kicked up all kinds of dust in the air. The little mouse family fell out laughing. They fell down on the ground. Their little legs were sticking all up in the air. And when they got back up, and they finished their meal and they were packing up and getting ready to go. Mommy looked at the children. She said, you know, children, it's like I always say, es muy importante para hablar otro idioma. It's very important to speak another language. Al fin.